everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, today we're going to talk about something a little bit forward-looking, but also something that's been done to great effect in uh, um, a prototype system to replace some production systems kind of at large scale. So, but still, it's a bit forward-looking in that some of the stuff we're going to talk about and then eventually demo is, uh, is available in Flink 1.2 snapshot in master, but it's not been a released version of Flink yet. Um, but more than just this demo that I want to do at the end, I want to talk about sort of like this idea of using the stream processor as a database. What does that even mean? Does it make any sense at all? And uh, you know, what sort of applications maybe does it, does it make sense? You know, and what drives, what drives this, this idea? So we are going to talk about that. Um, to get there, I'm going to make an attempt to, to get there by walking through sort of a, a bit of an evolution of different ways you could approach a, a particular sort of large-scale analytics problem. And we're going to move through a couple of architectures and look at some pros and cons and really look to see where this sweet spot is, where this queryable state idea and looking at this stream processor more like a database might be a really huge win. Um, so, yeah, pros and cons of each one. We're going to end up at queryable state, which is a new thing. Uh, this guy, um, one of the committers on Flink, has been working a lot on this. Many people have been involved, but Ufix Lebi has done a ton of work on this already. He's not here today, unfortunately. Um, or he'd probably be giving this talk. Um, yeah, and we'll end with a demo. So we need a motivating example. Um, we're going to talk about a few things in sort of looking at a particular example I think is going to help to like understand what kind of scale we're talking about, what kind of load we're talking about, and what are the trade-offs if we have a real application to talk about. So there's this project I was involved with. Before I worked for Data Artisans, I was uh, working on the streaming computation team at Twitter. And there's a prob project we were involved with there where um, basically the task was to count essentially tweet impressions for every tweet and keep track of that in a time series database. But it had the added requirement that um, not only will we be able to query for historical time series for any given tweet, literally any tweet, all the interactions over time, um, we also wanted really low latency access to the data like as, as right now as possible so it could feed back actually into the product and provide some interactivity and things like that. So we wanted like extraordinarily low latency access to the, to the results. So as we're, um, as we're counting impressions on some given tweet, we wanted to be able to immediately see those results. Uh, the end goal, though, is we're doing hourly aggregates, which really gets persisted over time. The idea was to have an hourly aggregate that you could query for any tweet. Our sort of granularity data points give me a time series information about every tweet. The scale is a million plus impressions per second. Um, Another interesting scaling factor that will come into play as you talk through some of these different approaches is going to be how many uniquely, how many unique tweets impressed per hour. That's going to be important um, because the sort of scaling dimension is going to change when you get into different sorts of approaches. And then again, the task is to compute hourly aggregates for these things. So basically, we're just reading a bunch of data from Kafka, grouping by key, and counting. It's really, really straightforward is what we're doing. OK, time series. What do I mean by time series? I mean, for any given tweet, I want to be able to draw a graph, and I want to be able to query like the last year of data. And with low latency access, what I mean is like that tip of the time series on the far right, I want that to be as up to date as possible. I want to know exactly, even in this current hour, even though the aggregate hasn't closed yet, I want to know what's the current count. OK. So there's a few different approaches. I'm going to cut a couple of these out because this talk ends up too long. So I'm going to start with the Lambda architecture. The first two are basically encompassed in this, this Lambda architecture idea. So the idea here of the Lambda architecture is to use two different systems, one for correctness and one for speed. So in our use case, what we would do is um, basically compute those hourly aggregates we talked about in the batch layer. So maybe using Hadoop. It doesn't have to be that, but typically that's how it's, it's been done. And so we're going to read from HDFS. There's probably some complex ingest pipeline to the bottom left that I'm not showing here, but it probably involves, maybe it involves Kafka, maybe it involves Flume and a bunch of other things. But eventually data lands in HDFS. And then we're going to do a map big, something like a map reduce job, compute all these hourly aggregates, and then in the end we can um, in the systems I'm familiar with, we were able to bulk load the data after you compute all these aggregates into the database at the end. Um, the particular job 
that I'm deriving a lot of this from, based on experience, we actually only ran this batch job every 24 hours because you couldn't really, we tried to tighten it up a fair amount, but for a lot of reasons, this batch job only ran every 24 hours. You can imagine it running hourly or something if you wanted to, but not much more frequently than that. Um, yeah, so if you look at the way the data is routed too, I just want to point out a couple things. Like in the bottom, it shows A, B, C, D uh, here. So that, those are supposed to represent different tweets by key. And you see how you kind of have this map step and then you have the reduce step where you're doing this shuffle of data and you get all the same keys to the same spot so you can aggregate them. This is really a common kind of approach. I mean, if you're going to do aggregates, you have to get all the data to the same place. And then you load it into a key value star. Uh, bulk load into a key value store. On the top, we have the speed layer. So the idea of the speed layer is that you can consume data from Kafka and um, do something really basic, which is to just directly in this lightweight sort of key value store, I have it labeled cache because that's often what I see in practice, uh, just something in memory and something not persistent because it's you know fast. Um, we're going to literally build Windows directly in that key value store. But the cost of doing that is if we have a million messages per second coming in, you're either going to hit that cache at a million messages per second, or you're going to hit that cache at two million messages per second. The reason I say two million is because in some real systems, you don't have an increment operation natively in the cache, and you literally read, modify, write. And so you end up with double the load on that key value store. OK, so a couple of dimensions about this sort of solution that's wor kind of worth working through is what is the load on the key value store? I mean the real database here in the bottom, the key value store. Um, pretty good, bulk load. If you compute hourly aggregates or a whole day's worth of data, we have the whole next day worth of time to like sort of load it all up and eventually it becomes queryable. Um, so you don't have a real big problem in terms of like scaling this key value store out. The other thing about that is we're only loading the aggregates there, right? So it's a, it's a massive reduction of data. So we're just loading the aggregates in the key value store. So your actual sort of number of, the actual number of unique keys per aggregate window is what's important with regard to how many keys you need to load into that um, key value store. Does that make sense to everyone? It's a, it's a reduction of data. Um, in the hourly case, the, the, tweet, the tweet impression number is something, it's actually something closer. I, I left it lower to keep the, the math simple, but it's something close to 400 million uniquely impressed tweets per hour. So for every hour, we're going to load in that key value store 450, 400 million keys, which really, if you do the math, it ends up being like 28,000 per second if you have the whole data to do it. It's not that, it's not that bad. Um, but on the top, we have this problem where we have this 2 million messages per second hitting this, this cache. And so this becomes a bottleneck really quickly. And depending on the cache technology you have and what key, or what you have available in your infrastructure, that thing can be a real problem. Um, in my experience, this was one of the biggest costs in all of the analytics jobs that I'm familiar with um, at Twitter like this. So what else is interesting here? The data availability. The data availability in this model in other words, when can we actually query it and get some realistic or interesting insight? What is that? Well, the idea of the Lambda architecture is that, well, you get some insight right away. Um, you're updating this, these values in this cache, and you're doing that in real time, so you can query that thing, and you can actually get some, some early results. Um, so that is true. You can get some insight there. And when everything goes well, not so bad. You actually get the more or less sort of like the right answer. Um, but when there are any failures, you have problems. So for example, if one of these source and sync nodes were to fail, uh, essentially what's not shown here is there's some, you store offsets in Kafka, the Kafka offsets somewhere. I think I have it in another diagram. Sorry. Yeah, see, like here you have the offset store outside of the system. But there's some dependency on some sort of storage so that periodically you write your current Kafka offset to that store, and that's sort of how you keep track of where in the stream you are. I'm just skipping ahead. So imagine that offset store was up here as well, because that's, that's missing from the diagram. So when there's a failure, what you do is you go to the last committed Kafka offset, and you start replaying the stream from there. Pretty simple. But nothing else changes. 
So when you do something like that, the obvious, uh, fairly obvious implication is that you're going to reprocess the messages you've already processed before because you only make this offset commit every so often, and you reprocess every message since then. And so in the end, what that means is because we're building these messages or these windows up or these aggregates up directly in that cache there, we're going to double count a bunch of stuff. Whatever that, whatever that is, whatever that sort of since the last checkpoint, we're going to double count that stuff and we're going to get the wrong answer. The other thing that happens is that um, sometimes you lose that cache. It just happens. Like you lose a shard of it or maybe it com becomes unavailable for some period of time. And in this system, there is no way to recover that cache. Now, not all, you could probably come up with some strategies, but the systems I'm familiar with, there's no real way to recover that cache because the data only, the only other place that data exists is in this batch layer, and it hasn't computed the answer yet, right? And it's not going to compute it until tomorrow. So for some period of time, all of the results in the speed layer are just wrong or unavailable and very, very hard to reason about. That's been my experience with the sort of the Lambda architecture. It works great when it works, but when something goes wrong, it's extremely hard to reason about what the quality of your data is. And so you end up waiting till tomorrow or whenever the batch interval finishes anyway, because that's the only data you can actually trust. So yeah, you get a little bit of insight. That's true, but you have some pretty big problems here. And it's not like, I mean, there are great things about this. And the, when, you, when these sort of systems started to become common, you know, it was the best solution to the problem at the time. And it also has the nice property that it's essentially built out of existing systems. You know, you have, a, you have this Hadoop thing and you have this Storm thing and you can just put them together and kind of get some of these good properties. Um, but then at the end of this sort of architecture, you have this query service thing. And what that does is provides like a uniform data model over these two systems. So you can make a time series query and it will get the freshest data available to sort of answer that query. So it abstracts across these two systems. It might make, if you're doing like a time series query where I, I want like the last month of data, but up until now, or the last eight hours in data, up until right now, it's going to get some of it from this key value store computed by the batch layer, and it's going to get the rest of it from the, the fresher data in the, in the speed layer. That's, how the, that's kind of the idea of the Lambda architecture. And then you, um, you merge the two, and you return a result. The query client, the person actually using this stuff just sees one system, and they query it, and they get the, they get the answer. So I think we covered all these different dimensions. Bulk load of the key value store, pretty hot cache, uh, which is a problem. Um, data availability is instant, but often wrong. And is it robust to failures? Yes and no. The batch layer is, and uh, the speed layer is not. So yeah, the older data, it, data is better. And that is kind of the idea. The other thing I would say is the fundamental premise here is that you can't do robust computation in real time over streams, therefore Lambda architecture. That's kind of how it came to be, right? Um, one other thing I would like to point out is that this is sort of, this is time series data. data is, and this is really common in companies. Data is actually produced continuously. So it's not like you just have the one batch and you're going to compute some stuff. You get data is arriving all the time, impressions data, obviously. It gets bucketed up in HDFS, and then you run a batch job. When that job finishes, and the, the next one's scheduled, and then it runs for the next day, and so on. So it's a sequence of repeated batch jobs. It's really continuous processing. It's really actually stream processing. It's just that it happens to be stored in these batches. The problem with that is that that is often leads to errors. And the reason is, is because you're arbitrarily, not arbitrarily, but you're bucketing messages. And I think, I imagine a lot of people in this room have systems like this where they, where they currently work. So you have these, you're bucketing data, you're storing it on HDFS, it's in buckets based on time, like literally like year, month, day, minute buckets, something like that. And then periodic, you process these with the batch job. But the problem is they're stored in those buckets usually based on ingest time. When, when did they arrive at, at HDFS or, or some upstream? Yeah, probably actually when they arrived at HDFS. And so in the real world, you have data coming out of order. And um, it's not like it's in time order. And it's not that it's at the right time when it hits HDFS, right? It's completely out of order. And it's the, the time of the data, like when the event happened, has 
very little to do with when it actually hits HDFS. So uh, you end up with the data that should be in the 12 o'clock bucket. Some of it comes late, and it goes into the 1 o'clock bucket. And you've got some of the data from the 11 o'clock bucket actually landed in the 12 o'clock bucket. And so you've got all this inaccuracy, even though this is sort of the batch layer, which is supposed to give you like the really good answer. You actually have a lot of problems there, too. And where you, if you have a streaming model, a continuous model for processing, you actually eliminate all these sort of boundary errors. So this is also a problem that comes up here. I think we probably talked about most of the points here already. Let me scan it. Um, yeah, you have, you have some of the best of two worlds, and you have some of the worst of two worlds. Um, that's really the truth. And you still have this problem that like, it doesn't really scale that well because of that reliance on the, in the speed layer on the key val some sort of key value store, whether it's a cache or not. Um, it's pretty hard to scale. And I would say also a pretty big con I guess I didn't mention is it's complex. It's complex and it's expensive to operate. And you have some frameworks. There's some things out there, like I'm familiar with Summingbird, where it tries to make it possible to write an application at a higher level and then sort of compile it down to like a storm job and a Hadoop job. Um, nonetheless, when you actually go to deploy the thing and operate it, you're, you're running two big data systems and two separate applications. And so it's actually a lot of... A lot of complexity and overhead and trouble to, to run systems this way. OK, so what maybe is an alternative to that? And can we preserve some of the good properties and improve, improve the, um, the not so good ones? And I totally tongue in cheek put on here the beta architecture just because it's the second, uh, it's the second architecture I'm covering in this slide deck. I don't intend for anyone to call this the beta architecture. I just thought it was fun to stick with Greek names. It's a little bit tongue in cheek. I think the whole thing's gotten a little out of control <laughs> with the Greek names for architectures. So, um, OK, so we have the, this, this, our second attempt here. What's different? One difference is that it's one system, which is obviously an improvement. Um, the second thing here is, I guess, if we start from the left, if we start from the left, you've still got Kafka, you've still got messages, sort of keys randomly distributed. Into the first, into the source nodes. You've now got Flink has got fault tolerant local state, so we can start to take advantage of that, which is really important and why these systems can now move into a different direction. Um, the source state is just this Kafka offset. It's nothing special, it's just some state that that, that node in the graph keeps, that operator in the graph keeps, so it's the, it happens to be the Kafka offset. You still have the shuffle, so all of the A's and B's go to the top, all the C's and D's go to the bottom and you have local state. And so we're, what we're doing is windowing by hour and counting. So what is the state? Amongst other things, essentially, this, the state that's interesting is the count per key. So all of, the, all of the A messages get routed there. We can have local state. We can get the correct count for all the A's, B's, C, D, C's, D's, et cetera. And then eventually, when a window is up, and by the way, I'm in, Implied here is that we're using event time, so we solve the sort of weird boundary conditions, and we actually complete windows when we have all the data. We deal with out of order, um, we deal with out of order data and all that stuff. You end up with the counts, and then when we when an hour completes, you actually write just the aggregate to the key value store. So we have a similar load on the key value store as before, because we're just writing the aggregates there. Um, that's where you come up with this 100 million keys divided by an hour, 28 keys per second. If you took the whole next hour to sort of gradually load the database, that's how much time you have. So you have to have at least the ability to write 28,000 keys per second to the key value store. But that's a heck of a lot better than 2 million. And something that's important, I guess, to notice is the scaling dimension, or the, what determines the load on the key value store is not the message input rate anymore at all. It's the new, it's the unique key rate for that time window. So if you happen to have a problem where key, new unique keys aren't created a lot, your key space might actually be fairly small, and you absorb tons of load in, as you aggregate the window, and you just have a, you know, you just have a, a, a very small load on the key value store. Does that make sense, more or less, to everyone? So your scaling dimension is different now. It has nothing to do with throughput. It has to do with your key space size. Um, so sometimes you get a huge win when you do it like this. This is actually a tough problem where you know, new tweets are created all the time. So the, the set of regularly impressed tweets is large. 
hundreds of millions per hour. So it's still a lot of keys, but it's a lot better than hitting the database for every message. The other thing we have, so we have fault tolerant local state. Robust, is it robust to failures? Yes, because I think there's probably been enough other talks and enough experience with Flink that we understand that this, this state here is safe and can be managed consistently in the face of failures. So, for example, if that window operator fails, it's not a big deal. Another one gets spun up. You replace it. You reload the state from the last checkpoint. Everything goes back to a consistent point, and it progresses together. Um, so you actually have still have exactly once counts in the face of failure, which is a much uh, it's an improvement over the the previous system, at least the the, the speed layer. Yeah, so it has a lot of really good properties, right? The one that it doesn't have is high availability data, or you know, data available now. It, it doesn't have that, but it has everything else. The other thing is we can start to tighten up the batch. It's not a batch processor anymore. We can very easily tighten up the aggregate to whatever we want. Hours, minutes, seconds, it's very easy to do. It's very easy to change. There's no real, real implication to doing it. So this is a very flexible approach to doing aggregations. Um, yeah, and then there's one other thing to point out, I guess. Is this local state, if you look at it, this is, this is sort of a, we've, we've sort of sharded this problem. You do, you do key by in Flink, and all the, all the keys get routed to the same nodes. You've got some number of nodes in your cluster. Say it's, here it's only two. Say it's 100. We've actually built, if you look at it, it looks a lot like a sharded key value store to me, right? All of the data for any given key, you know where it is, and it's right there local on that node. So we've already built a sharded key value store just by the nature of the way Flink works. So I think, you know, what led to kind of thinking about this is why don't we just query it? Why not, right? If all I want to do is have low latency access to this data right here, why don't we just query it where it is? The only other alternative is pushing it downstream to some other, some other queryable store. And if we want even reasonably low latency, like say, say we didn't have to have it immediately, but say we wanted every second we just wanted some fresh data. It's still, I'd have to write 450 million keys per second somewhere. You know, it just doesn't work. So the idea is, why don't we just query this where it is? That's kind of the idea of queryable state. Um, we actually did this at Twitter along with some other guys from the, the Flink community, and we kind of built a prototype last, at the end of last year to do this at Twitter and it ended up being a really big win. Um, prototype system, though. OK, so pros and cons of this architecture that's not really called the beta architecture. Dramatically reduced load on the key value store. The DB load is now relative to the key cardinality, not the message input rate, which is a pretty big difference, actually. It changes how you think about your problem. Um, much more correct. It's a continuous processing model, so it actually much more naturally fits what we're trying to do, especially in the face of out-of-order data and things. So better than the batch. You get more accurate results than the batch layer in this case. Um, yeah, we just have this one problem, which is how do we get access to that data with low latency? Ah, yeah. OK. So here, this is the Omega architecture. The, uh, the last architecture, even though it's not the last architecture in my slide deck. Um, the Omega architecture. Basically, it's just what we just saw. Everything's the same, except for I just have queryable state now. And this is something we can actually do. So you have this uh, query service here. This is what any client would talk to. It essentially makes Flink look as like a key value store. You can look up by key. It's quite simple. There's no query language. Look up by key. I, for this key, eventually, for this key, for this window, give me the current state. And um, yeah, it can also do this front thing like the Lambda architecture, where it merges the, the, the two, sort of the, the DB there, the key value store, and what the state in Flink is, and it can merge across the two, just like, kind of like the Lambda architecture, but in one system, uh, which is pretty nice. The other thing, because we still do have that DB, we don't have to keep all the state in Flink. We only have to keep the in-flight aggregates in Flink. So that's kind of a really nice hybrid. And if you wanted to build like a production system now, I think this is a really good way to go, depending on maybe what your query load is, which is something yet to be determined how well this scales on the, on the read side. Um, but I think it could actually do quite well. 
And yeah, I think that's basically kind of sums it up. We have the best of everything now, I believe. We have um, the do database load is quite manageable because we're only writing the aggregates there. We have, it's robust. It's robust against um, faults and failures. We still can cr compute correct results in any case. And the data availability is effectively instant. So a pretty good set of properties. The other thing you found in practice is because we got rid of having to scale this key value store out, you know, different systems are different. But I've actually, in, in real world, replacements of this architecture, a Lambda architecture with something like this, literally had um, hardware reductions over 100. 100x from what we were doing before. So this is an extremely efficient way to do this kind of, solve this sort of problem. Okay. Uh, we talked about most of this. So the it's dramatically less load, still quite simple. Um, correct and failure cases. The only downside is we still do need a database of some kind because I don't know. Can we really start, store very large state in Flink? Can we keep all of the key value, all of the time series data there? Uh, Stefan did a talk earlier, which is quite forward-looking about the same thing. Can we have very large state in Flink? Um, what does that imply? What is this line between stream processor and a database? I think there is some room for thinking about it because the, as, as Stefan said earlier, the it's not like it, you could have sort of a you can have a decent data store inside the stream processor that exploits the properties of stream processing. It doesn't have to be a fully functional sort of standard key value store because it has a very, very simple write path. You, there's a lot more, you know a lot more about the properties of the system and it's a very narrow sort of um, system you'd have to build. So that said, this is kind of a joke, but I just wanted to use this uh, this transformer in my slides. Uh, his name is Omega Prime. And so uh, he is the result of a combination of, uh, he was forced into combination with his brother. The result of a combination is Omega Prime, a seemingly unique individual who not only combines the best of his component parts abilities, but adds a considerable amount of power to the total. So we're naming this last thing uh, Omega Prime. And this is it. All I did is I got rid of the database, and I have this thing just query Flink directly. That's it. And in the bottom right there, it says, look, ma, no DB. So with that, um, yeah, I think it's fairly obvious. It's very simple. The, the con is, can we have very large state in here? If we can, and we can do that reliably and robustly, and people are actually willing to play with this idea, I don't know. I think it's got a lot of upsides. Um, OK. And I have an actual demo. So how are we on time? 12? Oh, perfect. OK. So um, this is from Flink 1.2 Snapshot. I'm running code you can run today if you want to go play with it. Um, what I've done is I've actually, uh, I took, I wrote a plugin for Grafana, which allows me to just query Flink directly. So if Grafana really sees Flink as a database in this sense, just little, there's a little JavaScript plugin for Grafana that I mostly copied from somewhere else because I know nothing about JavaScript. And then um, I have a little REST server that the JavaScript thing talks to. And it, in turn, uses the Flink st uh, queryable state client to talk to Flink directly. So, and by the way, we're high. Yeah, yeah. OK, so let's see if we can make this demo run. Um, it's going to be maybe hard to see the code. But essentially, I have this Flink job. Let's get rid of this. Super simple. Reads from a stream. It's fruits. Fruits being delivered. Um, so some number of, is it, I, I don't know. It, is that better? I need to jump around pretty quick, though. Ah, okay. Is that any better? Oh, yeah, okay. Okay. Essentially, though, we have a stream. We do this flat map. Um, we're, we're, just create, we're just simulating. It's just some data. You have just apples, oranges, and pears. Um, 
we are creating these keys with, uh, we're sort of creating these, um, it's a data point, it's just a key and a value. The key is the, which type of fruit it is, the value is uh, how many just arrived. And we're using a Gaussian generator in order to generate this data, so it's just totally random. But we know something about it in that since it's Gaussian, you should be able to, like, if you did a histogram, you should be able to see this, like, nice normal distribution. Um, that's all. There's not really much interesting going on here. And we just have this queryable window function, which is not going to fit on the screen very well. But this is just a regular Flink function you can write. The sort of magic is just this. This is the normal state API, um, if you're familiar with it. We just have list state per key. So I'm going to keep sort of a little bit of a, um, the, the most recent data points for each key. And this is kind of the magic thing you have to do. You just say, for that state, make it queryable. Once you've done that, it's queryable from the outside world. Um, other than that, we just sort of, like I said, I just keep a window of like the last 200 data points. And every once in a while, I just dump it, and it fills back up again, which kind of makes just a neat visualization. The only other data we have here, what's a query client actually look like? You have to go through these steps. This stuff's a little bit new, so it might take, it, it might, the, the form might be a little bit different by the time Flink 1.2 is out, but basically, um, you have to know which job you want to query. That's hard coded right now. Uh, you know which key you want to query, so you have to get a serialized version of that using the normal Flink serialization stuff. Um, and then you can make this query here. It returns a future. Um, so I'm asking for this job, for state named this, for this key, give me the result. Sorry, for this key, give me the result. I get the future back, I wait for the result, and then I simply, um, I, I deserialize it using the normal Flink serialization stuff once again. Because the, Flink, the state can be anything. It can be anything at all. And you, this is kind of just your hook into Flink serialization stuff. So you, you, it can be anything. You have to know how to deserialize it once you get it, because it's just bytes, and then you can use it. And that's basically that. And then we have this little, this little REST controller, really simple. Uh, this is using Finatra. If anyone's, I don't know if anyone's ever used Finatra. It's a really great framework for doing um, REST servers. Highly recommend checking it out if you like to program in Scala. Um, it's actually quite nice. So this is just a simple, this is the query endpoint, the, the plugin needs, and a search endpoint that populates some stuff that you'll see in the dropdowns. But basically, it ends up calling, the punchline is it calls query flink, which uses this query client to execute a query. And in the end, with all of that, actually, let me make sure it's actually running. Oops. Let's just see. I think I actually have that REST server already running. So I should be able to do some stuff with Flink State. So this is Grafana. I have this plugin that allows me to talk to Flink in here. So I say Flink State server. And then I can start grabbing some data. Whoops. And there is literally we are we're sort of directly inspecting the latest window in Flink. We're watching the data arrive. Um, that's kind of the latest window view in Flink. And let's see. It's kind of sluggish. That's just Grafana. <laughs> Here, let's give, it a, let's give it a break. I've seen this happen before. Sorry. Yeah. OK. The other thing I wanted to do is let's, let's show this histogram. Shoot. I'm going to add a histogram. Same thing. Let's grab Flink State. Something's, something's not going well. What's that? Yeah, something, something else is backed up. The, I'm not sure what's. Why can't I switch back to IntelliJ? Oh, maybe because of this. Ah, aha. Ah. 
works, sorry. Just want to make sure this is all in a reasonable state here. We have the flink job still running. This is the flink job running. Okay. Okay, and I'm just going to make the histogram look a little bit more interesting. And do that. Okay, and then let's just let it run and see what happens. Okay, so there we go. We're sort of directly introspecting the contents of the latest window in Flink with reasonably, in a reasonably real-time way. And that's it. No database involved. We're just running Grafana on top of Flink here. Um, it's kind of cool to watch the histogram when the window dumps and then kind of watch the data come in. And it takes that nice bell curve shape over time. Um, but that's basically it. Five minutes. We can take questions. I don't have anything else. So, yeah. <laughs> So one of the challenging things, of course, with querying distributed systems is if you want to do aggregates, right, of uh, getting the unique count of tweets, for example, yep. of the current window. How would you solve that over the multiple um, buckets you have? Uh, you mean all-time counts, like unique all-time counts or something like that? Oh, um, like, like top 10 counts, right? So what's the top 10 number? So it's, you, have, you can have a top 10 per uh, node. Yep. Right, but uh, the top 10 of one node might not be the top 10 of all the nodes together. Ah, I see. It's um, a good question. Uh, I haven't really thought about that problem very much. You'd have to eventually... Yeah, you'd have to put some bound on it, right? You'd have to window it in some way, and then eventually you'd have to be able to combine these things. So. At Twitter, often we think in terms of monoids. So you, you try to, if you could write that thing as a monoid, you can do it, right? Because you just, you pre-aggregate part of it, and then you aggregate it one more time. And you have to be able to do that with top K, or else you can't. There's no easy way to do it, right? Nonetheless, you would query the window at the end. The last, you know, after the, after the final merge and reduce, you'd query that window. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the only thing that's really new here is that, like, the state that's there, we can just query it where it is. What we can compute is the same as it always was. Yeah. yeah. Uh, next question. Uh, Kafka producer provides uh, at least once a uh, semantical guarantee. So uh, we might have uh, duplicates in Kafka topics. Yep. Uh, so how do you handle such duplicates uh, in uh, Better architecture or Omega Prime yeah, architecture? Yeah, like from an end-to-end so -end point of view. We have batch processing, so we can, like, within the batch process, pr processing, we can, like, filter such uh, duplicates. Uh-huh. So eventually we have, like, exactly months. Uh, sure. Yeah, well, so. not really, because, again, some of your data is going to be in the next batch. It's not going to all be in the right place. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, I mean, eventually you can do so you can uh, repeat such uh, batch process several times. So like w once per day, once per week, right? And eventually you you will have <coughs> such uh, such uh, guarantee. But the question about the beta or omega prime uh, architecture should we decouple events? I mean, I don't think there's any real difference between those two things. You can bound it in whatever whatever windows you want, and you can compute and you can dedupe within those windows. Um, if you have really have continuously arriving data, there's no difference between a window on a stream and uh, a batch, honestly. You can compute the same exact thing. Does that make sense? So the pro I'm not saying the problem is solved, but I'm saying it exists in both places in exactly the same way. 
what you can do is if you're going to do something reasonable, if there's some way to dedupe based on some heuristic, you're still going to have to bound it. You're always going to have to bound it and say, if duplicates occur within some time bound, OK, I can get rid of those. Anything else? Julian? I had to uh, last the question. Yep. Uh, actually, we did uh, something related to uh, removing duplications um, in our projects. So there are two ways. Um, so with the, the state API, you can handle duplication checking inside the state. Uh, you have to, to use like user-defined functions yourself. Another way um, is to somehow register a callback for late events, which is also nice to implement with uh, the state API. So yeah, I hope that uh, helps. Yeah, he has actually also built a system sort of similar to this with another approach. So it'd be an in interesting conversation, too. Do you have something, Julian? Right. Potentially, yeah. So, yep. Yeah. I mean, to, to me, the kind of the, uh, the place we should be heading is for end users to be able to query data via Tableau. Yep. Um, and they don't know the data in Kafka, but Flink is making it possible. To exactly. Exactly. Kafka. Yeah. Or while it's still maybe in the, right. in the pipeline, the stream processing pipeline. Right. Exactly. Yep. Somehow there's data, and people want to query it somehow, yep. and like, that's it. Like, make that whole thing work in the best possible way. Yep. Yep. Anybody else? OK. Thanks. <laughs>